Hey there, in this video we are finding out about the bubble sort algorithm, and this is in section 8.3 of the Gaddis C++ book. So we are talking about sorting algorithms in this video and next. The last couple of videos we were talking about searching algorithms, and here are sort algorithms. What does that mean? Well, sorting means to arrange values in a particular order. We've got a couple options for that. Could be talking about alphabetical order, like words in a dictionary, right? That would be like strings. Could be ascending numeric order, like pages in a book. Or it could be descending numeric order. Like as an instructor, sometimes I order grades from highest to lowest, so I can kind of see which student is doing the best. Though all of those are possibilities. Uh, in this video and the next, we're going to be looking at two sorting algorithms. We're going to be looking at bubble sort and selection sort. I will say that there are a lot of sorting algorithms in the world. We might talk a little bit about that at the end of the next video. Uh, we're starting with bubble and selection sort because they are simpler ones to get started with. And we'll probably be talking about other sorting options later in the course, actually. But I think this is a pretty good place to start with. Now, sorting is really important, right? And there's a lot of things in computing that require sorting to happen. You're working in a spreadsheet, and you want to be able to sort the various rows by different mechanisms. Um, I'm working in my operating system, like maybe the Windows File Explorer. And it lets me sort all the files in a particular folder. I could sort by the name. I could sort by the date. I could sort by the size, I could sort by the type of file, and I want to be able to do any one of those things, and obviously I want it to happen pretty quickly so I'm not waiting around for that to happen. So all those things are built into a lot of different computing systems. Maybe most important of all, of all based on the last lecture, is we want to have our arrays sorted so we can use binary search on them and get that cosmic speed up when you're hunting for things in an array. You need it sorted for that, obviously. So a lot of reasons why you want or you're looking for a fast and efficient sorting algorithm. Now, in this video, we are talking about bubble sort, probably the simplest one. Okay, so the concept with bubble sort is, let's say I have an array and it's all scrambled up and I need it ordered, right? Let's say I want it to be in ascending order from smallest to largest. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start off and I'm just going to look at this pair. I'm going to compare these two, right? I would like this to be lesser than this. If it's not, then just switch it. Now this will be lesser than this, right? So one way or another, make a decision. If this is in order, keep it like it should be. If not, just swap these two. Now take one step down the array and do the same thing with these. Compare these two. Is this lesser than this? If so, good. If not, swap them and make it so, right? And then do the same thing over here. Compare these two. Is this lesser than this? If not, swap them so they're more in order. Great. Now that probably will not have the whole array sorted in order at this point. It'll be more ordered, it'll be a little bit better, it probably will not be totally sorted. So what you do is you start all over again and do the same thing all over again. Compare these two, okay, if you need to, swap them. Compare these two if you need to, swap them. Compare these two if you need to, swap them, right? Do it again, do it again. Every single time you do that cycle, it's gonna go a little bit more ordered. And what you're going to do is you're going to keep a marker about when I did that pass, did I have to make any swaps? If so, then you're going to have to go and redo it. If not, if you went all the way through the array and these are the right order, and these are in the right order, and these are in the right order, then you're actually done. At that point, the whole array actually is sorted and you can stop. And that's how bubble sort works. Right? That's what it says right here. You compare the first pair of elements. If it's out of order, exchange positions, then they're at least in order. Move down one element, compare those, exchange if you need to, compare, continue to the end of the array. Pass through the whole array again, exchanging is necessary, and you just keep repeating that until you have a pass made where you didn't make any exchanges at all. That's sort of how bubble sort discovers that the array is finally fully sorted. Let's look at that in pseudocode, okay? So here I have a do while loop. You definitely have to go through this at least once. And you are going to be keeping a flag, a Boolean variable called swap, to mark whether you made any swaps or not, right? Again, that's the marker about whether you need to keep going. So you start off and you set the swap flag to false. So far, I haven't made any swaps. So right now, that's false. You're going to have a for loop here, right, where you're basically counting all the way from the beginning to the end. Start at zero to the next to last subscript, right? When you, when you uh, check in on these two, you might need to swap these, but there's nothing after the last one, so you actually don't check that compared to something after it. So zero through one less than the last subscript. 
And so inside that for loop, right, you're doing the check this, check this job, and check this job. If this array value here is greater than the one right after it, greater than array plus than uh, array count plus one, that's in the wrong order, and you better swap the contents of these two things. And when you make that swap, then set the swap flag to true as a signal that you made a swap on this particular pass. And you do the same to these two, and you do the same to these two. Um, and you keep going that as long as you've made any swaps on this particular cycle. If you have, you go back to the do line, right, and you do it again. At some point, the whole thing will be ordered because it's getting a little bit more ordered every time. When it's ordered, you'll go through the whole thing. The swap flag will remain false, and that's what's going to get you out of that loop. Now, a couple of things about that. Notice that there's two loops here, right? We have nest loops. We've got an outer do while loop, and we have an inner for loop. So two nested loops, and we in our review component, we said that was going to be important. The other thing is, you know, why do we use pseudocode? Usually it's to highlight the important things and gloss over some details. So when this line right here in the innermost part of the loop says swap the contents of this and this, you probably know that itself is going to be three lines of C++, right? You actually need another variable. And you say, I'm going to take this and copy it in my third variable. I'm going to take this and copy it over here. And I'm going to copy what's in my third variable into here. That's actually how you get a swap done because you have to copy the values from one to the other. So we are kind of glossing over the fact there's going to be three lines of C++ to actually make a swap happen. Maybe you already know that. So let's translate this to C++ and you'll see all the details like that little detail right there. Here is a function called sort array. It's a void function. It's not returning anything, right? You're passing the array that you're interested in sorting in here. As we've always said in C++, that takes two parameters. Here's the array and here's the size. So the function knows here's where the array starts and here's where the array ends, right? There's what your two parameters are basically saying. In this case, this is an integer array, but you could modify this to sort all kinds of different arrays with any kind of data, basically. Here's our Boolean flag called swap that's going to mark whether we made any swaps on this particular pass or not. Here's that temporary variable, right? When you make a swap, I said you need this third variable. That's the temporary variable we're going to use for that copy job. You have a big do while loop, right? Do while, as long as you've made any swaps recently, you better go back and check again. So as the loop starts, set swap to false. Count everything in the array from zero to one less than the size, like we said. So you're basically looking at every, every single thing in the array and comparing it to the one that's right after it. If this array item is greater than this array item, it's in the wrong order. So the innermost part of this if statement is basically the swap job, right? Like we just said. So when you need to make a swap, take this thing, store it in the temporary variable, right? Take this thing and store it in this first thing, and then take the, the temporary variable and put it in the second thing, right? And once you've done that, you swap these two things, and you better mark the swap flag to say that you've done that because that means you're going to have to go at least one more iteration. And every time you do that, it gets a little bit more sorted, gets a little bit more sorted. At some point, it's all in the right order. You make no exchanges, and the process ends. And that's bubble sort. Let's hand trace that. Make sure we understand what's happening there. Okay, so let's say I have an array that starts off as 17, 23, 5, 11. Obviously, the size is 4. We're going to hand trace the values in the array at each iteration of the outer loop, right? The outer loop is the do while loop. So I'm going to go through a whole cycle of the outer loop and write down the condition of the array just as that iteration stops, just as the do while loop gets finished. Obviously, the array is not sorted, right? The numbers are going up and down and up and down. So this is the kind of thing that you would want to sort. Here is my table I'm making. Again, I'm keeping count of how many steps through the do while loop, right? How many steps through the outer loop is happening? And every single time, I'm just going to write down what the condition of the array is. You get into this function. I'm going to call this step zero. We haven't even gotten into the do while loop yet. And the array is starting at the 17, 23, 5, 11. That's exactly what we just started with. So you go into this do while loop, right? And one at a time, we're going to compare each pair. 
So compare the 17 and the 23, right? I want it to go from small to large. That actually is the correct order, right? So I am not going to swap the 17 and the 23. Then I'll compare the 23 and the 5. Now that's out of order, right? The 23 is bigger. So at this point, we would swap the position of the 5 and the 23, and the array would go 17, 5. And then you would have to compare, because you'd have a 23 there now, you'd have to compare the 23 and the 11. And again, the 23 is too big, right? So you'd swap that, right? You'd swap the 11 and the 23. And at that point, at the end of the first iteration, the array would be 17 and 5 and 11 and 23 is what we just came up with, okay? Now we just made some swaps. So we're gonna go back to line 39 and we're gonna do this whole thing all over again. Let's try it again. Compare the 17 and the five. Well, the five is too small, right? So we better swap those and I'd have the five to begin with and the 17 next. Then you'd have to compare the 17 and 11 Again, that's out of order, so you'd swap those, and you'd have 11 in the second position, and you'd have 17 in the third position. Then you'd compare that 17 and that 23, and that's fine, because 17 is lesser than 23, which is what you want. So I think the array would then be 5 and 11 and 17 and 23 is what we just came up with. Yeah, that's what you get at the end of the second iteration, 5, 11, 17, 23. Now, did we just make any swaps? Yes, I think we swapped a couple times for the 17 right then, right? So swap would be true at this point, and we're gonna have to go back to line 39 and do this again. Here's what happens. Compare the five and the 11. Well, that's fine, that's the right order. Compare the 11 and the 17. Yeah, 11 is less than 17, that's what you want. Compare the 17 and the 23. Yeah, that's what you want, don't swap those. So at the end of step three, right, you have it in the exact same order you just had in step two, actually, 5, 11, 17, 23. But what's different here is we didn't make any swaps. So the swap variable will be false at this point. And when you hit line 52, while false means that the loop ends, means you are not going to go back to the do loop. At this point, the loop finishes, the function exits, and the array actually is in the right order. Great, okay? Couple notes about that, right? So notice that bubble sort has this one extra iteration at the end, for us it was step three, where it discovers that the array is in order, right? There will be one more iteration where it makes no adjustments at all and it's finding out that the whole thing's in order is the way it works. The other thing is that the way this works is that if you notice, large numbers very quickly fly to the end of the array right? Like 23, the biggest thing in the whole list, immediately went to the end of the array at the end of step one. And that always happens, right? The big thing's going to move and move and move and immediately back at, be at the end of the array. But small things only come forward by one step each iteration. So if you look at where the five is, right, the five came forward by one step, came forward by one step each iteration. Same thing with the 11, right? Came forward a step, came forward a step, just one step per iteration. So big stuff flies to the end really fast. Little stuff just takes one step at a time, one step at a time. And that's why this algorithm is called bubble sort, is because that action of the small things coming to the top of the array is kind of like bubbles in a beverage sort of slowly percolating up to the top of the glass. And so that effect is where people started calling this bubble sort. That sort of makes sense to me. Great, that's bubble sort. So hopefully, like if you're taking a test in my class, hopefully you can do the same kind of hand trace maybe on the next test to prove that you really understand how bubble sort works. Note the loop again iterates one last time without making any swaps. And to me, that's bubble sort discovering that things actually sorted. All right, what are the trade-offs to bubble sort? Well, it's pretty easy to understand and implement, right? It's never not very much code. I will say that on a random day, if I'm programming and for some reason I just need to make my own sorting code, probably bubble sort is what comes out of my fingers. It's sort of conceptually the, the very first thing that I think about when I think about sorting algorithms. The disadvantage is that it's relatively slow compared to some other algorithms. And let's think about that. Now remember, bubble sort has nested loops, right? There's an outer do while loop 
and there's an inner for loop. And when we reviewed it, uh, when we reviewed nested loops, when we started second semester programming, we pointed out that the total number of iterations is the product of your outer loop and your inner loop. Like we had an example of like, I've got three rows and I've got three columns in these nested for loops. How many total iterations? It was gonna be nine because three times three is nine, right? You multiply the number of iterations. Well, if I have an array of size n, whatever that is, the do while loop could possibly go as many as n times, right? And the for loop, right, where you're looking at every single thing in the array could also go n times and n times n is n squared. So worst case scenario, if you have a really scrambled up, really poorly formed array, it might be n times for the do while loop and n times for the inner for loop, and that would be n squared total times. That can get big pretty fast, right? If I have an array of size 10 and I bubble sort it, I might need as many as like 100 iterations, something like that. So it'll take some time. And it also does, does a lot of swaps. Uh, that's important because writing information in the memory is slightly slower than just reading information from the memory. So all these swaps and all these adjustments and all these copies, that's taking quite a bit of time on the CPU, all things considered. So, you know, a simple algorithm <clears throat> seems a little bit slow. So when we go forward and consider other algorithms, we'll certainly be hunting for hopefully some sorting algorithm that's a little bit faster than that and maybe, maybe takes less than n squared total iterations. You know, if you have two nested loops, it's gonna be hard to get away from that. But that's bubble sort. All right, so if you're a student in my class and we were in person next, this is the lab we would probably do working with the bubble sort. And this lab comes with a completely pre-made bubble sort that already works. Um, this uh, particular bubble sort is set to sort the array in ascending order from small to large just like the example we were just looking at, that's probably the thing that's most common. And once you understand that, the goal of this lab would be to modify that code so it sorts the array in descending order instead, from biggest to smallest. That's actually not that hard. The more interesting thing is we were also gonna modify that program so that it prints out the array at the end of the outer loops, basically so it recreates the hand trace table we just did. And that'll allow us to compare our manual hand trace versus what's actually really in the memory system at the end of each iteration. So the end of the do loop, I wanna print out the whole array and see what the current condition is. And compare to the total number of steps, just like that hand trace. So hopefully that'll give us some confidence when we do that, that we understand bubble sort. When we come back next time, right, we're gonna be looking at the other sorting algorithm in chapter eight, the selection sort. And we're kind of hoping that it's faster. I mean, you know, if you compare last time binary search to linear search, binary search was cosmically better, so much better than linear search. So maybe next time selection search will be the same thing. We'll find out next time. I'll see you then for that.